Hi, Comics Gate. Uh, this is what brings uh, uh, brings us to you, Ethan. You got this comic, Cyber Fro Cyber Frog, Cyber Frog Two. That's the second one. Yeah, Wreck Planet. Let's 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 talk about your story first with uh, with getting canceled, so people can understand what Comics Gate is and uh, why they should they should hear your story. Because I know a lot of people uh, may not be familiar. Oh. Basically, you are responsible for some of the, mo the most iconic uh, comic book imagery. I like that. I don't know if it's true, but I yeah. Well, well hold, so so you created Flash's mother, Nora. Well, that's one thing. Yeah. No, no, I, I know, right? Yeah, but but yeah. Like, hold on, the movie that's coming out, the Flash movie. Yeah. It's about him going back to save his mom, is it not? Right. I think it's the, so. The yeah. The Flashpoint paradox. I guess. That's a a major DC storyline. Right. I think that's that's important context for people to understand the amount of influence you've had on the industry is 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 large plus. In the, in the video game that came out a few years ago, Injustice 2, yeah. Atrocitus is a character who is in it. You can play as him, a character that you you drew, you created the art for. Uh, yeah, I created the whole thing. I'll take 100% credit for Atrocitus. <laughs> yeah, I just, I had the name. I said, this is so DC Comics, Atrocitus. It sounds great. So you actually created the character. Absolutely, yeah. And then one day you said, hey, everybody, I voted for Trump. And they then they, they came after you. Well, they, they knew I was a Republican. I mean, they did. I, I used to I, I mean, I literally was the only elephant in the room all the time when I went to comic book conventions and everybody looked at me weird. Uh, I would have friends. I would make friends with other professionals. Uh, and then uh, I would I, I don't know, we'd spend a little time apart. And then the next time I'd see them, they'd go, you voted for Bush. And they'd have this look of disgust about them that I was like, yes, I'm a Republican. I voted, I voted for Bush. Uh, and then that was fine. I think the Obama years were great because, uh, for me anyway, because uh, I wasn't being persecuted. I did, nobody was worried about anything because Obama was president. They won. Uh, and Trump was a joke. I really didn't think much of Trump in 2015, but he won me over by 2016, and I was a fan. And I loved the Pepe memes. I loved all that stuff. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, uh, it was no big deal until Trump actually won. And when Trump won, I just thought, great, it's our turn. You know, very naive about the culture war. Wore my MAGA hat that was autographed by the president, and I took a nice picture and I tweeted it out. And that's when I started to see, I started to see messages from my peers saying things like, Ethan's MAGA, Ethan Van Skyver's MAGA. Did you see that? Yeah. Well, I guess he's canceled now, right? Everybody, he's canceled. And I didn't know what that was all about, but there was definitely like rage over this idea uh, that somebody who was a fairly influential artist at DC Comics was a Trump supporter. And uh, I didn't think it was going to, you know, I basically talked to a few of them and kind of said, hey, this is the way, oh God, I'm so naive. I said, this is the way the country moves forward. Right step, left step, you know, basically we all get our turn and hopefully, you know, this is progress. But then I got a message from somebody who said, how could you do this? You voted against all of your queer comrades in comics. How do you understand that our lives are in, are in jeopardy and you voted for that? Don't you care? And I guess I wrote back to that person and I kind of said, uh, well, uh, I guess I don't care that much about that. I guess I have other <laughs> priorities in my life than, you know, you're, we all have our different, you know, issues that we vote on. Uh, anyway, my response to that tweet or that private message got shared around to all my peers. And now everybody was furious with me because I'd basically invalidated the lives of my queer uh, associates in comics. Uh, and then the final thing was I was persecuted. Uh, people were coming after me. Um, I had a, a writer I was working with on Batman. I was doing Batman for a little while. This great guy named Greg Hurwitz. And he had a mutual friend. He had a, uh, Jordan B. Peterson was his friend. And he kind of said, have you heard of this guy, Jordan Peterson? I said, yes, he's great, you know. Well, he's seen your work, he likes it. He wants to know if you'll illustrate his upcoming book. And uh, I was just like, well, if I do that, if I do it, I'm going to get a whip in. I know it. You know, that's going to be a big problem. I'm already on the verge of cancellation. I was terrified. Uh, my wife and I just had a baby uh, who was diagnosed with autism. Uh, and so I needed my job. I really needed my job. But on the other hand, I had this conversation with Jordan Peterson where he said something that really impacted me. And I still think about this every single day. And it helps me step forward. It helps me take another step. Uh, he said, uh, Ethan, I said, I'm scared. Dr. Peterson, I'm scared to illustrate your book. 
And he just said, uh, Ethan, you can't let these mobbers back you into a corner. I wish I could do a Canadian accent for you. You can't let these mobbers back you into a corner. And I just thought to myself, you're damn right. You know, I'm going to illustrate your book. And so I did. I illustrated 12 Rules for Life. It turned out to be a number one bestseller, and that was it. Though it may have burned some bridges or seems to have, it, that it launched your career in so many other ways. That book is huge. It was, it was big, but again, it wasn't really my book. It was Jordan Peterson's book, and people just kind of incidentally go, oh, your name's in that. Like my little sister, Hannah, who's a big fan of yours, she's watching right now. Hi, Hannah. Howdy. Uh, you know, she, she was shocked. She's like, oh, we love that book. I can't believe my brother illustrated it. Like I just, you know. So um, uh, in any case, like that, it's more stuff like that. But what it really did was it just kind of like set my feet in stone. Like I am now officially, I guess, a culture warrior where I didn't even believe the culture war existed until then. Wow. Uh, and what year was this, 2017? 2017. And I, people were calling me a white supremacist and a Nazi and all these things that in 2017 really hurt. You didn't want to be called a Nazi. You didn't want people to think you were racist. And But those are the weapons that they use against creative people and yeah. pretty much anyone that they want to destroy. Nobody, you, you can't deny that you're racist. It's... Racism is on a spectrum. So is yep. white supremacy. And you're, if you deny it, that proves it. In, in a sense, yes, it does. The Kafka and trap. You're not even aware that you're racist. Let me explain why you're racist. So it really is a, a, a nasty situation. And uh, DC Comics called me up. And it was, uh, I got to say, DC did the best they could. But they were being swarmed by the media uh, over my existence working there. Uh, the thing that leftists do that they're so great at uh, is they have accomplices in the media that will write the articles that you want them to write, that they want them to write. And then those will get published on the Daily Beast or any of these awful like uh, websites. Uh, and then they'll refer to those articles as proof that you are exactly who they say you are. And then those get referenced in Wikipedia. Your Wikipedia is soon denouncing you as a whatever it is, a white supremacist or whatever they're calling you. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, so that was... Uh, uh, that was that DC Comics called me up and God bless them. They, they tried to stand by me as much as they could. But uh, somebody who I really liked there, a friend of the family, called me up and I said, am I OK? Is everything OK? And I could hear him pouring a drink into a little glass. I could hear the ice. And he just said, we can't renew your contract. Wow. And uh, he took a big drink and I was like, I, I have a child. I have a baby. I have a, a baby with autism. I, I need my job. And he said, well, you've got four or five more issues on your contract, and then that's it. We gotta, you've got time to find other work, you know. So uh, it was absolutely terrifying. Uh, you know, yeah, but you know, one thing I don't like is when people use the word "can't." That's really annoying. When when what it means is I don't want to. We're, we don't want to, but we're like mm -hmm. we can't refer your contract. No, they could. They just chose not to. I, they could have, but who am I? Uh, I mean, they were, DC Comics was in all kinds of trouble. They were trying to sign with AT. I'm making excuses for them. They were trying to sell themselves to AT&T. They were trying to get good press. And they were deliberately, the left was deliberately putting all this stuff in the media to make it look like they were employing white supremacists. So they really didn't have, as a business, a choice. And I, I, I give them a pass. I do, because they they've always been good to my family up until the end. And they're still writing me big royalty checks for movies <laughs> like The Flash that are wow, coming out. Wow, really? So, yeah. That's cool That's then. That's nice, yeah. yeah. Fine. Were, in, let me ask you about, uh, you know, before all this stuff went down, did you notice in the industry, before your cancellation, an encroaching wokeness, cult-like mentality, stuff yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I didn't understand what it was. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of strange women <laughs> I hate to put it this way. Sorry, ladies. Uh, a lot of strange women kind of suddenly showed up in the comic book business and basically came at us with this criticism that this was clearly a boys club. It was unsafe for women. And everything that you guys are putting out is sexist and it's racist and it's homophobic. And, well, we're going to fix that. If you hire us and you should hire us, we're going to fix that. Because if you don't hire us, you're sexist. So suddenly all of these women show up and they start basically making changes to this sort of male dominated hobby. Uh, this is this is a male driven culture. Obviously, obviously it is. These power fantasies uh, are mostly for boys, uh, but they started to make these changes. Uh, the women suddenly who used to be beautiful and curvaceous, we used to be able to glorify and exaggerate the female form. 
Uh, suddenly, we had to cover them up. Breasts became smaller and smaller until they were just sort of pecs. There was actually a weird phenomenon called the unipec, which was just one breast with like a stretched cloth over it because you didn't even want to define breasts in any way in superheroes. Uh, and basically everybody got scared. And then this other thing happened um, because there were women in the workplace, of course, the men started flirting with the women. Uh, you know, God help them. Uh, these guys started to ask girls on dates and then the girls would say that that was sexual harassment and that's when cancel culture really started. I saw some very talented guys get their lives turned upside down uh, because they were stupid enough to ask so-and-so at the bar at a convention if she wanted to come up to their hotel room. Uh, and uh, this wasn't like a power uh, disparity. I, there was one case where an editor with a lot of power was putting his hands on women. I understand that. This was different. This was a, a case of peers. Uh, we're both creators. You're a female, I'm a male, I'm gonna ask you on a date. I feel threatened if I say no to you. All of the stuff that happened, the Me Too hit comics pretty hard. Uh, so there was uh, that whole situation with, which caused everybody to really get in line. You did not wanna question these women. You didn't wanna, started to realize they were activists. You don't wanna question these activists uh, at all. Allow them to make these changes. And then the other thing that happened was there was a guy named Orson Scott Card uh, who was a very, very famous uh, sci-fi author. Uh, and he's also Latter-day Saint. I was raised Mormon, uh, so I know that he's Latter-day Saint, and so he shares the values that I was raised with. He came out and said he disagreed with gay marriage. He didn't think it was something, marriage was something between a man and a woman, uh, and it was a holy, uh, you know, a holy thing. It shouldn't, gay marriage shouldn't be a thing. Uh, and then DC tried to hire him uh, to do a Superman story. And the entire industry went crazy trying to get this Superman story, a short story by this legendary, Orson Scott Card, look him up, legendary uh, author, uh, canceled. And that was an amazing thing to me. I was like, why can't we just publish the story? I don't understand why disagreeing with him about this one political idea means that he can't write a Superman story when everybody loves his work. So that's when I started to see woke creeping into comics. And uh, you know, by the time 2015 rolled around, my peers were saying strange things to me. They were saying, uh, you're a capitalist, you're a Republican, right, Ethan? <sighs> you care about money. <clears throat> uh, imagine this, 50% of the country, 50% of the world is made up of women. And we're not marketing to them at all, are we? Uh, if we started marketing and changing these comics to appeal to more women and hiring more women, do you understand what would happen? We would double our income. We would double our revenue. And you, as somebody who cares about money because you're a capitalist, and I was like, aren't we all capital? No, we're not. Okay, just me. Uh, that means something to you, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, that was the philosophy. That was the big lie uh, that allowed comics to come in and become woke, uh, I think. From there, you, you hire activists, they hire more activists, yep. and the whole thing erodes from the inside. And then people stop buying. Yeah, when you want to appeal to women, then the guys maybe are not getting appealed to. Like, you can't appeal to both, I would think. They're, you might be able to. It, it's, it's even weirder than that. Lego. Lego did a study, which I always cite, and this is amazing. I don't think anybody's thought of it this way, but Lego was wondering why girls don't play with Lego toys. They're boys, but they're not really gender-based. They're just bricks. So why are little boys playing with Legos, but girls aren't? Why, why is that? So they got a study together. They got 2,500 kids, 1,250 boys, 1,250 girls, and their parents. And they put uh, Lego figurines, let's just say a Batman Lego set, in front of these kids. And they just studied how these boys and girls played with their Lego toys to try to figure out what the missing problem was. What was what's the missing piece? Well, the boys pick up Batman, pick up a little Batman figurine, and they become Batman. That's the whole thing. Like they, like they take on those traits. They imagine they're Batman, you know, and that's how boys fantasize. That's how boys play. Meanwhile, the little girls pick up Batman and Batman becomes them. They project themselves onto Batman and suddenly Batman is acting like they are. Wow. Which is why Barbie is so popular. What's Barbie's personality? Who's Barbie? He's whoever the little girl who's playing with Barbie yeah. is. We were just talking about that yesterday. Boys pretend that they are He-Man and girls pretend that Barbie is them. That's right. Yeah. Huh. 
Yeah. Wow. I yeah. used to do that with G.I. Joe's. I would yeah. become the guy, Duke, or Scarlet, or whoever the character, and we would act like me and Steve. We'd play G. We'd set them all up, and then I'd be like, I'm coming! And he's like, no, look out, look out! Ah! And he'd be the Cobra Commander, and like we were acting as the characters. I didn't know there was a... I've never, like put my personality onto a doll before. It's why that's they say it where a lot of the representation stuff comes in. It's a feminine trait that's been learned by males to, to look at representation as if they have to see their exact selves in another character. I don't know if when I played with Legos and stuff, if I became the character or whatever, like if I was playing with Batman, Batman was doing Batman stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I would have like Batman and like Cyclops and I'd be, Batman would be like... But Tim, you knew who they were. You they were themselves. They I, were themselves. Yeah, they were not me. They, Batman you were was acting Batman. as them, which is why, as a as a male. Well, I mean, like this is what I'm trying to say. Like, yeah. I wasn't going like oh, I'm Batman and I will fight you. It was like I have Batman Cyclops and Batman would be like yeah, two, two, like so. They were two distinct characters of themselves that I would have do battle when I was. Were any of them you? No. Okay. See, that's the whole that's, thing. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, not, like, not that I would be like I am Batman and like walk around and project myself and as like Batman becomes me. I'm saying like. The, 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 I would view them as them, as their characters. Of course. But for yeah. the girls, you're saying, like, they would be like, look, Jenny would be playing with Batman. She'd be like, this is Jenny. So she'd have the Batman doll, and that, it would be called Jenny, and that would be her? Like, that kind of thing? Pretty much. I mean, like, whatever a, a little girl's aspirations are, uh, she'll project them onto Barbie. Rather Does Barbie than... have distinct traits? Like, Batman has Batman as Bruce Wayne. Batman has parents. You know what I'm saying? Does Barbie have distinct traits that they would even be able to quantify other than what their physical appearance is? Deliberately, no. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's why it's so successful. You know, Those... that's, that's, so, now, per, now, imagine, I don't think men and women change as they grow older uh, in, in that way. That's just, that's a, a big difference between men and women. So now imagine that you're a creative person who's writing Batman. Uh, now men just go, okay, well, I'm going to write Batman as I know Batman. He's going to be Batman. He's not going to be me. I don't want to put myself into Batman. He's going to be Batman. I'm going to do the best Batman story I can do. These ladies, Batman starts getting sassy. <laughs> they start to write Batman with more of their own traits. And soon, before you know it, it's like these characters are unrecognizable. They're sitting around having coffee and bars and having chit chat and stuff and it, it you know they they they're they seem to be unable to actually and i'm not saying all of them there are some ladies who are great and the senti shout out louise simonson great writers but many of them are just you know projecting themselves onto these <clears throat> characters and maybe it's because they really just don't care that much question ethan did you notice when the women would come in and start to change the system did they have kids or were they childless? Oh, chi they're childless, largely, yes. This, something that someone pointed out is that women that aren't mothers tend to try to mother society. Yep. In, mm -hmm. They get into HR, and they'll try and mother the company. They'll try and, like, protect and nurture and change. And, like, no, that's racist. Do it this way. Do it this, you know. Captain Marvel s robs a guy in the beginning of the, mo in the movie. He's, he says you should smile. So she steals his <laughs> clothes and his motorcycle. Think about that motivation. That is the woke feminist motivation of I can do whatever I want. Then think about the other character motivations. Jude Law's character says, control your emotions. And then finally, at the end, she goes, no. And that is her ultimate motivation. The story arc for her is she can do whatever she wants because she's powerful. And she shouldn't have to listen to any man who tells her to control herself. Captain America's motivation is I will die for you so you can live a better life. It is the Hillary Clinton quote personified when she said women are the real victims of war because their husbands and their brothers and their sons die. That's that's that exemplifies it perfectly. That's amazing. Self-sacrifice versus self-validation. That is the difference between the way I was taught to write and draw superheroes uh, and the way superheroes are being presented today. Right there. Everything is a... You know, all of these new superheroes that are coming out of Marvel, they're all selfie taking, self aggrandizing narcissists. Eating lunch and dinner together at diners. Th that's what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, there's no, you know, my book, Cyberfrog, Cyberfrog says in the, in the very, you know, in the very first couple of pages, you know, he just says, because people don't like him, he's ugly, he's Cyberfrog. So he says, I've found something to love about humans and I'm willing to die for them, you know, and that's. That's the thing. That's heroism to me. We're here. Comic Skate's here to, to step in. And, and you know, that's that's a, a good... See, we love comic books. I could talk about this all day long. I grew up with these superheroes. I love these superheroes. I've been a creator. I've worked on these superheroes for uh, most of my life now. But 
Uh, unfortunately, the the way things are at Marvel and DC, they're inhospitable. Remember, People what, what was right. that super woke comic they made with safe space? and It never n- came new out. Warriors. And they should have <laughs> yeah, done they, it. They, they never, they never released new, Oh, they yeah. never released that. What is it? Snow, what is it? The new New Warriors? Yeah, so. yeah, New New Warriors. I wonder if that was a joke. Like, I feel like that whole thing was <laughs> a hoax. It definitely became one. Yeah, it sure did. Oh, what a horrible concept. Look at this. Okay, for those, that, for those that don't know, you need to understand that the, the hugging brother and sister, right? They were brother and sister. Yeah. Snowflake and safe space. And one of them they actually oh, described. Dor- one of them they actually describe as being a, a stereotypical jock. Which I've never seen a stereotypical jock with pink hair, but that's just me. Wait, wait. The best one is the door of the explorer. Yep. Trailblazer. It's, it's, yep. Is that, that, that what they called her? A chubby Inuit. Mm. Yeah. A, a, who had a backpack that she could pull anything out of? And yeah. the other one. The had, door of the explorer. And the other one is, <laughs> is uh, powered by internet gas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The internet. What were? Oh yeah, that guy with the green This had visor. to have been a joke. It was huh? a troll. I, it must it wasn't it was as they bad as Gotham High. Look, it's they on the website, introducing. It. Yeah, it's real. They I just, mean, if they had released it, people would have bought that. That I would have bought that. This yeah. this is a, this is an important story for for those that are that don't understand the culture war. What happened, in my opinion, is that Marvel started getting a bunch of emails saying you need to do this, and then someone went to a board meeting and said, "This is what kids want. You gotta sell a product they'll buy." And they went, "You're right." Then they made it, and they got roasted. And they said, "We don't understand." They're emailing us saying they want this because they don't realize it is a t- it is a cult of annoying, loud people, and they wasted tons of money, and they are destroying themselves by supporting this. But they don't buy. It's not kids buying these comics, right? the The majority of the the large scale audience is still men in their it's, 30s it's, and, yeah, in the forties and fifties now. Us, like, yeah. and that's the problem. Right? Kids they have s- moved on to yeah. manga. I mean, yeah. the, the kids, exactly. the teenagers yeah. are buying manga now. We yeah. lost two generations yeah. to manga from crappy storylines. Yeah, but it's I be- don't know. Maybe it's because it's because manga storylines are are better. I I grew up on Batman. And DC animated series, Justice League, mm. and uh, uh, X Men, mm-hmm. and all that stuff. And then it, when it started getting bad, I just went straight to to manga stuff, yeah. where the storylines were still good. Ethan, do you write on a, a, like a Wacom digital tablet, or do you write on paper? Uh, no, I write on paper. I, yeah. Does I it free your mind? Do you feel freed from the algorithm when you're working? I just, it, for me, it's a tactile experience that I really need to touch paper and a pen and actually feel the drag of the pen. I can't really put that into words, but it's how I've always drawn, and I'm not looking to, to change that in any way. Um, I see Wacom tablets and everything. Uh, don't hate me for this, fellow artists. <laughs> I see it as cheating. <laughs> I mean, it really is. Like, uh, you get one shot at it, and you can use white out and everything like that, but when you can just blow up this part and move this around it doesn't feel it's kind of like the digitization of music yeah it, it just feels a little artificial to me but no judgment you know people do their thing i'm old-fashioned adrian curry says thank <laughs> god stanley left us before women destroyed nerddom comic con e3 dc marvel and now lord of the rings all lost to us because of feminism hey i don't want by the way i want to just uh, i don't think women destroyed nerdum. i think feminism did and yeah. i think you know woke destroyed nerdum. i mean we had We've had females who understand that mostly, you know, when you're writing Daredevil, you're writing it for boys. Uh, and they understand that and they do a great job. So uh, women, you're welcome in comics, but understand 95% of your audience is male. It's just so knowing just your audience. Bear that in mind. This is an attack on masculinity. They hate it. That's that, correct. Like during yeah. Gamergate, the big thing was they wanted to make walking simulators. They're like, why are games always predicated on violence? And it's oh. like, Sex every, and every violence is what sells. Have you played the new Harry Potter game? No. It's like, it's Harry Potter, but there's combat in it. Yeah. And it's funny because there's substantially more combat than Harry Potter had in its whole story. Yeah. Like, granted, there were big battles in Harry Potter, but later on, for the most part, it was like solving puzzles. Well, because that was the structure of the story, right? It made sense for the ba- the battles to happen later on. And there is good feminist sure. There is good feminist media. I will always push people to Buffy the Vampire Slayer. If you want to watch actual good feminist television with a feminist character that actually exists in a world where she has emotions, she's a fully-fledged person, and she is not somebody that just beats up a bunch of men and makes a bunch of quips. She's actually vulnerable. Go Hunger, watch Bunker Games. Yes. No, go to, if you want to get a comic skate project by a, a completely based woman, Irene Strakowski left Marvel Comics of her own accord to come be comic skate just out of a wow. moral sense. She's got a book called Fiendish 2 on Indiegogo right now. I promise you, it is amazing. You will love it. Go back what Fiendish if, 2 on Indiegogo. What if, what if we find a way to team up and we can help distribute the stuff through our website? Tim, are you that good of a guy? Are you an angel from heaven? I mean, <laughs> I, 
I'm audience. saying like we we keep talking about how like the what the number one thing we do outside of talking politics is trying to build culture. So I've said this before. Look, I could hire ten more conservative commentators, libertarian commentators, suspected liberals, and just be talk radio. Mm-hmm. Or we can try and win a culture war. The Daily Wire does that, and they do it very well. They they've 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 got a great they've done a great job of finding personalities who who are in this space of the freedom faction to talk about these ideas. They've also done big cultural endeavors. My thing is like I'm going to focus strictly on the cultural stuff and try and just build that kind of stuff. So if there was a way that we could create some kind of portal or some kind of hub on TimCast.com that, like I was mentioning before, we wanted to do some kind of like weekly chapter release or something. You know, maybe there's a way to do it Shonen Jump style. Were you where, talking about like digital release? Yeah. Like, because uh, Amazon did Comixology, right? And then they, they, the infrastructure for it was like really hard to upkeep from what I understand. Ethan, do you know anything about that? Like uh, Comixology, which was bought by Amazon, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they 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 destroyed the technology yeah. and made it really hard practical and hard to use. Here's what I'm thinking. I, I I'd have to know what you guys are working with and what you guys need. But my idea is like, if we had a way to do like, I wanted to do weekly chapters of comics, kind of like how Shonen Jump they'd put that release out, and then you have like chapters every week. The new Naruto would come out, and I would read it. But if it's too hard to do one chapter of a comic every week, is what people said, it could be like one chapter every other week, and you interlace them. So if it takes someone two weeks to do a chapter, then, you know, you put that up and then two weeks later, the next one goes up and then in between you're, you're, you're skipping out or maybe even three weeks or something like that. Some way to have like, hey, this Wednesday is the latest release of the chapter of whatever. We have to create stories. This is yeah. the thing. I mean, you know, comic books are easy, e- an easy way to put stories out there. And the problem is right now the left has complete domination. Woke has all of the storytelling that Americans at the West are feeding to their kids. And they, our kids are hungry for it. They're, they're going to Japan for their needs. We really do need a way to get our stories out there to more people. Uh, th- this non-woke stuff. Now, I would love to talk to you about that. Let's raise something up. Okay. Uh, we need the Freedom Faction to have these cultural tools. I don't care if it's me or anybody else who's doing it. Comicsgate's clearly doing it. Support Comicsgate. Thank you. So this Can is, you say hi, Comicsgate? Hi, Comicsgate. This is what we need to do. (laughs) That's a thing. We need people who work at Marvel and DC to stand up and say, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. It's not, doesn't make me feel good. And then go independent and win. Uh, Ethan, you want to shout anything out? Yeah, I'd like to shout out John Malin's Godlike on Indiegogo. I'd like to shout out Shane Davis's Inglorious Rex 2 on Indiegogo. And of course, Cyberfrog Dark Harvest uh, on Indiegogo. If you'd like to buy... Uh, any of the old Cyberfrog stuff, you can find it on eBay. Just search for Cyberfrog. Uh, our seller name is Cyberfrog9. We ship same day that you order. You'll have it in a couple of days. Thanks for listening. Comicsgate.org. And then follow me on Twitter, at Ethan Van Skyver. Hey, I love, this was like one of the best Fridays so far. At least fun. in my I had This a great was an time. awesome conversation.